ready to get started, right? Okay, we have a large gathering of students here. So uh, welcome, everybody. This is, uh, I believe, our first online lecture. Yeah, it's first as well. Yeah. So um, I, I first learned about Raphael's work from a, from a former student long ago. And um, ever since then, I've been a huge fan. So I'm really excited to uh, introduce Raphael Rosendahl. And I think his, his work is very fitting to, to be a part of a virtual lecture. Um, and so he's actually um, lecturing from New York City. He's a Dutch Brazilian artist, and that's where he lives, um, born in 1980. Uh, and he's a visual artist who uses the internet as his canvas. His websites attract large audiences all over the world with 50 million unique visits per year. Um, and his artistic practice consists of websites, installations, lenticulars, lectures, and haiku. And uh, I'm going to keep that very brief so that I can hand it over to Raphael to begin to show us some of his work. And thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Raise your hands, everybody in the room. Yeah. Okay, a little bit of interaction. So, uh, yeah, it, this is very new to me to do an online talk. So, that normally I say something and I hear something, but now it's kind of like I'm a madman talking in my own room. No idea what you guys are doing. So, um, I'll show you guys how I started, the different kinds of work that I make, and I'm going to start with websites. So that's what I'm known for mostly. Um, at any time, if you guys want to ask a question, uh, any time is fine. So, uh, it, so we're not going to do an hour lecture where I just talk. I'm just we're going to do it in little bits so you guys can interact because looking at a monologue is a bit boring. Um, so here we have a page with all the websites I've made over the years. That's uh, I started around 2000. And the whole fun for me was that it, basically I loved making moving images and interactive images. And I was very excited about this new world where uh, you can make things that you couldn't do in video or in traditional moving image. So you can make generative images and interactive images. And I wanted to explore that. So this is a website called stagnationmeansdecline.com. Uh, just going back a few steps, it was very apparent to me that when you make interactive art, that it should exist online. Because I saw a lot of interactive art, uh, I, I saw it in books, but I couldn't experience the real thing. So I went to the library and asked them, do you guys have CD-ROMs that I could experience the interactive art of the past? But they didn't have any um, of those books. So I thought, OK. Interactive art should really live online because it's already so small. It's such a niche, so it should really be available to the people. Um, so I was interested in interaction for the sake of interaction. So here, this is a, an interactive depiction of a hand. It slowly goes back to its shape. Um, and this is it, my, my take on interactive art is very basic in the sense of perception and depiction. So you look at the world. And one of the first things we had to do in drawing class, I don't know if you guys had to do that, is you have to look at your left hand and draw it with your right hand or the other way around. Um, it's just one of those basic things that you have to do as an artist. And I think because the browser and the computer is such a new material, then we have to revise what does it mean to look at your hand and what does it mean to depict that hand. And um, the same here goes for any of my images where I just like to research something at its most fundamental. So I'll look at a frying egg and then find a way to depict that. So this is not even interactive, but you can just go to this website anytime, flyingfrying.com, and it will always be there. The egg is always there. And um, yeah, it's just killing this egg. It's just uh, doing its thing. So it's very important to me that the freedom of the internet, it's, it's not a casual thing. I, I don't take it lightly. I take this freedom very highly that art is very restricted in the sense that art is always channeled through a, another 
a middleman or a middlewoman, either a gallery or a publisher or a TV channel. There's always someone you collaborate with to bring it to the people. And then I thought, well, if we have the internet, then I could show my drawings, I could show my videos, but I could also make something specific for the browser. And that was the important thing to me, that if I make art for the browser, then I'm not dependent on anyone to show what I want to show. And what that means is that I can make things that are hard to explain, hard to defend. Like, okay, I want to make a website, and there's a trash can. And whenever you throw the trash in the trash can, the, the trash can spits it back out. And that's the work. And I find it hard to believe that that's possible uh, in a world where there's more more decision makers. So either whether that's Hollywood or whether that's publishing or whether that's museums, I think if you want to make a work like this, a lot of people will say, are you sure? Shouldn't it be a bit more interesting? Shouldn't you do a little bit more research? Shouldn't it be this? Shouldn't it be that? And on the internet, you could just completely, there's no, no one looking over your shoulder asking you, why is that important? It's just, I wanted it to exist. That, that's basically the, the, the premise of all my work is, basically, I wanted it to exist. Um, this is floatbounce.com. So whenever you click on the background color, you create a new circle that starts to bounce around. And you can click on the circles again, they disappear. Uh, this is uh, innerinterior.com. It's a, sort of an architectural study where there's always a, a space that's created by three lines. So a lot of my work is created by very simple rules. So here the rules are there's a number of grayscales, there's a vertical line, a horizontal line, and a 45 degree angle line. And if I click here, it creates a new division of those three lines within the old division. And the center, if I click here, that's the center and it will move to the center of the screen. And so that means um, you can keep on clicking. It's this same simple rule, and it kind of looks like you're creating many rooms or you're looking at corners within corners within corners. Um, are there any questions so far? I think you should probably come over here. We have a, we have a question from, yeah, from yeah. Detroit. Okay. Thank you. This is Mandy. Hi. Hi. Do you create all of these designs in HTML and code? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, there's any questions. I started, um, I, start, I always start with the paper and pencil, and then I move to Illustrator to uh, make a diagram of the idea and make make kind of a storyboard or I'll make a rough animation. And I used to make the works in Flash, but uh, now they're in JavaScript, but I work with a programmer. So from, from the beginning, I, the first few works that I made were, in, it, I made on my own, but then quickly I hit a wall where I couldn't program it. And he was a friend of a friend and he was really good and he enjoyed doing this kind of work. So we started working together and we've been working together 17 years now. So. Really, any idea I've come up with so far, he, he figures out a way to do it. So th there's never been a problem. It, it, it's been a challenge to, uh, when, when Flash sort of came to its end and then HTML5 was not so mature yet, it was kind of a challenge. But now HTML5 uh, or JavaScript or whatever you want to call it is, is quite robust. And so the pieces uh, work really well across devices and it's really fun seeing the same piece work on many different because people experience the internet that's one of the interesting things to me that um you can watch there's no best way of viewing the work the, the work exists in many iterations so you might watch it as you watch it now with your class and then maybe later you watch it on your phone and then maybe later it'll be in public space on a big screen and it's just like music like you listen to music at home you might listen to music while you're driving or while you're jogging, and you might see it at a concert or a party. And because you experience all the instances of the same song, um, they add to the experience. And the, the, the song is not a single object. 
people always want to know with an artwork what is the ideal way of viewing it, but I don't think there's an ideal way. Um, any other questions? Oh, I, I, I Mandy has one more question for you. Okay. Uh, but like this is pretty early on the, in the lecture, so you might cover it. Um, since you make this in Java and you used to you work in Flash, did you come across a lot of challenges from switching platforms? Like are there are pieces that you have that are like lost now and that people can't see because they're from Flash. Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. Flash is still around, so it's it's been okay so far. It's not on mobile, but uh, uh, so first of all, nothing's disappeared yet because Flash is still around. Then the biggest challenge for from Flash to JavaScript was the sound. So the, the sound is still not as robust as it is on Flash, where a lot of browsers have a hard time playing multiple sounds at the same time or many of them, and Flash never had a problem with that. You could play. 15 event sounds at the same time and make a really chaotic collage of sounds. And that's not really possible. So often I make a sort of a simplified version for HTML where you might have three sound sources and the Flash version is a bit more elaborate. But I think in one or two years, you, and a lot of the pieces, uh, some of the old pieces we recoded, like this one, uh, just as a test. And there's no way of telling visually if you're looking at the flash version or the html version it's it's still it's both vector it's both scalable that was something that was important to me from the start um, sometimes people ask me why my work looks the way it looks and it's really for practical reasons it's also because i'm lazy so it's really the laziest way of, like how can you show a kiss but it's also i want it work that scales well that uh, it can work on any device and it can work in portrait orientation. Or, so if anyone here in the lecture now can go to muchbetterthanthis.com and if you look at it on your phone, you can tilt it, it'll still look good. You can, whatever do your device look on. And, and then um, here, I'll show you. So the idea was always that a website exists in many instances. So here is, is the same website on Times Square. Um, this was a project called Midnight Moment, and uh, the Times Square Alliance is an art uh, council, and they curate every midnight of every day of the year. Uh, at three minutes to midnight till midnight, they show one artwork across many screens. And so for one month, each month they select another work. And so for the, in 2014, they selected this work of mine. So I was very honored to show my work there. And that's kind of what I mean with the, a, a website should be like gas. It should um, fill up any potential space. And I think that's a basic uh, uh, lesson you learn in web design. Like don't think of a website as a solid thing. It's more of a fluid thing. And I think that's an interesting idea for a work of art, that a work of art has to be, in this case, much more fluid than you would think of a sculpture or a painting. Um, so we have a question here. Okay, cool. Yeah, the more questions, the better. Yeah. Hi there. One of the, Hi. One of the icons that I certainly recognized uh, compared to the others was the Mondrian, the Broadway Boogie Woogie. Yeah. Was, that seems to stand out uh, in terms of uh, maybe. Uh, Compared to the others, so I'd, it's, I'd be interested to know what you did with that. Okay, let's see. And why did you choose that? I mean, it's the only kind of painting that we see as a source. There's something here. Flash is not turned on on this computer. Um, let me check. There you go. We had tested this before, but it should work now. Um, yeah, there it is. So I I um, made a few cover versions of older works, and this was one of them. So I thought it was interesting that 
Mondrian made a painting inspired by the grid of New York, the, the city plan. And it's a very static image, but it, it does something to your eyes. And in that sense, it's dynamic. But I thought it would be interesting to just literally program it to behave like traffic. So together with the programmer, we made a number of rules. So the cars are, I'm hearing someone in the background. The cars are behaving like real traffic. So they decide whether to turn left or turn right or keep going and there's traffic lights. And uh, so here's another example of a cover version of, of an older, this is a, a version of Marcel Duchamp's bicycle wheel which I believe is the first interactive artwork, as far as I know. So it's a work that you can touch and then it, something happens. Most works you're not allowed to touch. But the ironic thing is that because it became such an important piece, you're not allowed to touch it anymore. So it's, it's the world's first interactive piece, but it's not interactive at all. So I thought it should then, the best thing we could do is then have an online version that's accessible to everybody so people can touch the wheel. Um, I think that's about it of literal version. Here's another version. This is a, a, a painting by Roy Lichtenstein of a seascape. Um, when he plays with uh, the bende dots, which do something to your eye and create a kind of movement. Uh, but bende dots also have this very static feeling of being frozen and, and sort of like a grid in the sense that your eye is stuck to the, to the dots and has a hard time moving. I think very different from regular painting. And then I made it so that the movement is in the surrounding, sh the, the edges of the shape, but the, the content is not moving. So you have that contradiction of, movement and, and uh, extreme sort of locking your eyes and moving it at the same time. Um, I'm looking right now if there's, a, oh, here's another cover version. Yeah. So it's an ongoing thread for me, the cover versions. This is homage to the dot com, uh, which is an homage to Joseph Albers, who made homage to the square. Joseph Alves was a painter who moved to the US, I think from Germany. And he made all these studies of uh, color, always in the same composition, in different colors, and always a square canvas. So he called it homage to the square. And then I thought it was interesting that the browser is not fixed. So it's, you're not sure if it will be a square or a rectangle. So it's an homage to the dot com, not to the, to the square. Um, does that answer the question? Any other questions? Or should I move on to the next chapter? I'll move on? Okay, so um, we're looking at my exhibitions page. And when I started making websites, it was a challenge to think of how do I show websites in, in the exhibition space? Because when you're at home, you are behind your computer and you kind of forget about your environment. Um, so sometimes I would show the website simply projected, but then after a while I was not satisfied with that and I thought I should expand the space. So I covered the floor with mirrors um, just so you feel more like you're diving into a website instead of just it being a little thing that you look at. So th that was my interest to really forget about your environment and, and create a rich environment. And then, uh, so every time I do an exhibition, it's an opportunity to try something new. So in this case, the mirrors arrived, but some of them broke, and then I decided to break all of them. Uh, and that became very interesting that you no longer see them as separate pieces, the mirrors, but all the pieces together become one big floor. Um, this is a different take on mirrors. So here, uh, 
these are mirrors in the sizes of screens. So this might be the size of an iMac, and this is maybe a 24 inch iMac, and then you go to a laptop. This is a big TV. So the work is called Popular Screen Sizes. And it goes from the TV, the biggest one, down to the iPhone. And here's another example of sort of a huge room filled with broken mirrors and projection, again, to disappear in the work. And in this case, sometimes I'll show interactive work or sometimes I show work that just moves on its own. But here, I hope you guys can see it. There's a, a number of trackpads here and you can manipulate the composition on the projections. So it, it's, I, I never had a studio. I always used exhibitions as an opportunity to try things. Um, this is another approach to exhibition. So I always thought new media exhibitions are always extremely difficult in terms of organizing. So uh, it's always a lot of stress and all the curators I know uh, didn't sleep so much. They were always exhausted and stressed and, and had a hard time having a personal life. So I thought maybe we can find a way of curating that's easier. And I was living in Berlin, and all my friends owned projectors. They were all making moving images. So I thought, if we have a space and we just invite everybody, um, and everybody brings their own gear instead of us taking care of it, and it's a one-night exhibition, uh, then it should be fun and easy. So this was the first, we call it BYOB, bring your own Beamer. A Beamer is a projector in Dutch or German. And so everybody brings it, everybody sets it up, but it's very flexible. People are constantly moving their projector around uh, and responding to each other. So they might find work that relates to each other and uh, that might remind them of another work. So it's a very organic being. It's a very um, flexible format. And I made the first one in Berlin and it was a really good atmosphere and everybody was excited. So there were people in from other towns and they said, oh, I should try this in Athens, or oh, we should do one in New York. So we started doing them in different places. And uh, I put the manual online and on the BYOB website. It's, uh, it's here. And immediately people were excited to do more of these. So the, the idea is that um, the internet is kind of stuck in the computer, but it doesn't have to be. So for one night, everybody brings the projector and the internet becomes a very social, real life experience. So this is the manual. Uh, find a space, invite many artists and ask them to bring their projectors. That's it. So it's really easy. And here's a list of all the BYOBs that have happened since the beginning. I think we're at 300 or something. So it's been all over the world. Um, and it's been really kind of a, it's a thing for young people to start thinking about exhib exhibiting because it's a little bit, there's some uh, anxiety that comes with exhibiting. It's kind of scary, but this way, I think it's a nice way of uh, getting your feet wet. Is that the name of the expression? Yeah. Um, you have any questions about this so far about exhibitions and uh, BYOB? This is another exhibition in public space in, in Korea. It's also, it, yeah, there's more and more around the world a, a big LED screen. So that's an exciting space to, for digital art. Um, should I, I, should I go to the next project? Any questions now? We don't have any questions in Detroit. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, the next project is abstract browsing. Um, I'm gonna start, it started with another project called text-free browsing. So most of my projects are single, 
um, JavaScript or Flash, single visual experiences in a domain name. But this is an experience that it's a Chrome extension. So I thought when the internet started, there was a, a way of web surfing that was image free browsing because the bandwidth was very low. So as a way to save money, you could turn off images and just browse the web, uh, just pure text. And I thought the opposite is interesting when you uh, browse without text. So this is text-free browsing is a Chrome extension. Uh, you can just install it if you're using Chrome. And so what happens is you visit any website as you normally would. Somehow I always visit New York Times to show this, I don't know. Um, and then you click here on the icon and you lose all the text. So you just surf the web. Uh, it's kind of, I call it the information superhighway without information. So any, any page you visit um, is basically, it's a more, more chill way of seeing the internet. After that, I started thinking more, what's an, because the, the web is a very flexible thing, which we might not realize, but as you're watching, a lot of stuff is happening, and you can influence it by uh, um, manipulating the way the code is read. So the next step for me was abstract browsing. And then again, if you go to a website like CNN, um, I already installed the plugin here. And so the, you just hit this button, and it changes it into an abstract composition. Um, so I made that first, and then I started thinking, what can I do with this? So I was very interested in the history of painting and the idea of the artist coming up with rules or the artist coming up with a desire why the work looks the way it looks, um, and, and the depths of the soul and deciding this work has to be here, and because it, like a Rothko, like he, from the pure vision of the soul, an image, a, a painting arises, a pure experience. And the web is the complete opposite. It's not because it's beautiful or moving, it's because it's efficient. That's why pieces of information are structured the way they're structured. So uh, CNN will do lots of testing, deciding, okay, if we put this over here, we get more clicks. If we put this over here, the readership goes up. If we put this over here, our ad income, uh, ad revenue goes up. So they're constantly evaluating what's efficient, uh, not what's beautiful. Um, so then I start surfing and surfing with this plugin and taking screenshots of, of all kinds of websites, particularly like just thinking of a uh, any site or any the Ask Me Anything's on Reddit look really good in uh, abstract browsing. But Pinterest will look very different. So every kind of website has its own character and its own kind of compositions. And then the compositions I'm looking for are compositions that a painter would not come up with, that sort of uh, counterintuitive to what a human would do. Um, and here, if we go to Pinterest, So it's interesting to me that these compositions are a combination of, of human decisions and machine learning and user input. And it's constantly evolving. So the way we think about these compositions and, and the machine is constantly learning and thinking about how can I be more efficient. So that's the, the Chrome extension. And then I started making uh, tapestries based on those compositions. So I'll show you here. Uh, these are weavings, they're woven. And I've, the textile and the computer felt very connected to me because I found out later. But when you make images on the computer, it's very natural to print them. But the printer kind of feels more like photography and it doesn't feel like the way uh, code is built 
out of building blocks and pixels and somehow the stitches of, of um, textile felt more related to pixels than the sort of high resolution approach of photography. And it, it was just a more honest material for me. And then later I found out that the, the history of the computer started with weaving. So the punch cards that you use for weaving were the first digital image format. Um, let me show you. And this is uh, 17th century stuff, so it's really old. It's really before the computer, but that's the way fabric patterns were made at the time. Now the computer is connected directly to the weaving machine, to the loom. But it, it just felt very natural to have digital images become uh, tapestries. There's also some other way, but here, this is, for example, Google image search, where it tries to put as many images as possible in one view. And all the images have different aspect ratios. So it has to somehow figure out a way to squeeze all that information in. And here we see a Reddit thread, and this is the Gmail inbox. So these are all things that we look at every day. And um, I'm interested in pausing at those uh, compositions. This is the google.com homepage and a Gmail. And here we have, uh, this was the first exhibition of these works in Los Angeles. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Huh? Oh, it's not there. Raphael, we have a question. Yeah, cool. Please. Sorry? <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> what drives the color in all of these? Is there anything uh, derivative of the websites? Or like no, say for the I, Gmail I, or anything? Or do you, are you randomizing all of it? Well, I, when I made the plugin, um, I call them my primary colors. So they're not, uh, there's a color spectrum. And we've defined uh, primary colors, which is, is a little bit arbitrary. It's just that the screen was made out of RGB. And that way we can generate the most colors. And so I wanted to have the about 12 colors that had the most possible contrast. That was my emphasis. So it, it could have been different kinds of grayscale, but I felt that color really emphasized the composition even more. I really wanted it to be uh, an aggressive approach to composition. Because if I would have taken the average color from the web page, things are kind of subdued, and it, it, it's a lot of sort of sand colors or uh, light blue and things like that. And I felt like the, the composition would not be, I really wanted to shove the composition down your throat. That, so that's why the colors look that way. Is there, but beyond that, is there something like, say in a Reddit thread, uh, that triggers it to be blue versus oh, no, it's, turquoise? It's so it, it looks at all the fields, the color areas, uh, all the divs and the tables and the images and the whatever section there is. And then it just picks a random color out of a list of 12. Okay. And uh, let me show you. If you go, for example, this is Google image search. Then I hit the button and uh, you look at the composition and every three or five seconds it refreshes. Okay. See refreshing, okay. And I keep waiting. So what I do every day is uh, I browse way too much, which is a, uh, we all do, and then we feel bad about it. But then I'll go to my history and then uh, visit all the pages that I browsed that day and then go through them. And then I kind of turn them on like this and it just wait a while until I see one. So that's the thing, the, the human decision for me. So everything is automated, everything is random, but the human decision is, is picking which ones should be materialized. So. I'll make about a, 100 images a day, so 3,000 images a month, and then times 12 per year. And out of that, I have to pick about 15 that 
will be materialized. So it's a bit of a, that same thing we have with digital photography where you just take way too many images. And in terms of color, I just pick the composition that is most striking to me or most, I try to find the weirdest compositions that don't make a lot of sense, right? You, like, no one would ever come up with that on their own. It's just a weird machine human hybrid. Um, and the colors is also a bit of a personal thing, it's just the, the colors that I like. But um, my argument is mostly that I wanted to emphasize the composition as much as possible. And I tried it with sort of pulling color from the website and taking the average colors, but that result very often in programming, when you work with random colors, it has a certain look. Um, let me see if I can find an example. <coughs> <clears throat> Maybe somebody, it, it just, I don't know if we'll find an example. But, uh, uh, somebody chose very bright colors here. It, it, there's something in programming that when you define the colors, it becomes much more interesting. And that if you, if you pick pure randomness, it, visually, if you look at a distance, it's always kind of gray brown. Right. I, I was just curious about that because I worked with Python and some of those things a bit on on various stuff, but never to this extent. But okay. Yeah. No, I, I think I think color has always been very important to me. I've always been very controlled about it. Um, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, we have another question, Raphael. Yeah. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, are these printed textiles? No, they're woven. So uh, that was an interesting uh, jump into the material. That I, I went to this place called the, the Textile Museum in the Netherlands, and you can rent time to work on the textile projects. And I went into the space thinking, OK, I'll just pick the threads, and that'll be it. Like The, the, the threads will be. Uh, what the color is built out of. But it turned out the way you, you weave, you have to always work with a few threads at the same time. So all the colors are kind of mixes. And it turned out that the brightest kind of pink would be magenta together with fluorescent orange. Or the most interesting blue was white and light blue together. And uh, there's a moire effect that reminds you when you take pictures of your screen. I want to see if I can find these. This is the website of my gallery. And there's some close-up images, I think. Hmm, where is it? But yeah, it's a very, it, it's hard to, and that's one of the funny things now that we're talking. It's, it's this thing when you make physical objects and you can take pictures of it, but it's never the same. It's, uh, so here you see it a little bit. In, I hope you guys can see this. Yeah. This is a close up. Um, but all the colors are built out of multiple colors and they, they kind of give you that pixelated feeling or that feeling of when you photograph your screen with your phone. Thank you, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, let's see. So I've made so many websites that I also really ask everybody uh, if you have time to go and browse for yourself because it's really the best way to experience the websites. The, the websites are funny because I, I talk about certain aspects like uh, interaction for the sake of interaction, randomness, generativeness, but the real core element of all my websites is that I don't know. That's the most important thing that I really make them. I, I'm very um, it's a big point for me to be able to do things that you're not sure why you're doing them. 
And I, I think that's really hard in, in school because you're taught to have a group critique and uh, things have a purpose and uh, you're, always taught to, you're always taught to make sense in a way. And so for me, the internet was a place where I don't have to make sense. Uh, this is a website called Lots of Many. So there's many balls coming out of the bucket. Um, this empty room com. I, I can talk a little bit about the commercial aspect of, of my work, or the, the sales aspect. Um, so when I started making websites, it was really because that's the place I thought I could be myself. And then um, it, at the time, around 2000, a lot of people were making things called experiments. And it wasn't sure whether you were an artist or a designer or an architect or a motion person. It was just people doing experiments online. Um, but then from the start, I thought a lot of people would have a folder called experiments. And then you would have experiment one and experiment two. Not really a title. And it never felt like a finished work. So I started putting each work in a domain name. That was important to me. That uh, as soon as you put something in a domain name, you give it a little bit of value. You say, okay, I'm going to spend $10 a year for this work to exist. So it's more than, it's the same thing with uh, what I was talking about with all the screenshots of abstract browsing. It's, it's not just that you want to make a valuable object. It's also which one of these do you care about? And that's an interesting question to me. So the domain name is also a way of saying, okay, I, I care about this, I want it to exist, and I want it to exist for a long time. And the domain name also makes it so you can remember where the work is. So you can always remember fillthisup.com. It's an easy name to remember. Or uh, deepsadness.com, and then you can always go. So, but later I, I started just putting works in domain names, and later, together with some other artists, we came up with the idea that the website is also a commodity, the, the, the domain name. Because everything online is infinite, you can copy anything, there's no original. But a domain name is a scarce construction. It's really, if you try to come up with a domain name, it's not easy to find one that's available. And it's even something that you can't forge. It's, uh, you can't make a copy of a website. You, you might hack the domain name, but it's really hard. It's, it's not like pirating a movie. You could, you could take the files of this website. That doesn't mean you own the website. So um, the website, when it's sold, it's sold to the collector with a contract. And uh, we both sign the contract, me and the collector. And the contract says that the work has to remain public. So they have to do whatever they can to keep the work alive. And um, then this way, it's, it's a partnership between uh, public space and private ownership. I, I, I kind of um, frame it as a as somewhere between vanity and generosity. So the, the name of the collector is mentioned here. And the collector can tell people, look, I, I have a work that's viewed by millions of people every day. Um, and, and it's great. It's not that you want to hide it. It's the more people see it, the better. So, um, and that goes back to what I said about interactive art, that interactive art is really hard to experience in documentation. Um, and so that's why I really feel strongly about art in the browser for educational purposes. Because I, I feel like art is a continuous conversation between artists. Um, and it's pretty easy to understand a lot of the history of painting through books. You can go and you can see the decisions that were made. But for interactive art or computer art, that's really hard. So I think the browser is really the best place for uh, interactive or moving images, generative images. Are there any questions now? Hey. 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 You mentioned sound, but 
everything that you've shown, uh, I don't know if it's because our sound is off, but yeah. Yeah. have you incorporated any sound into the works you've shown? Or... Yeah, well, this, this <laughs> one has a thing called a, uh, could you mute the mic for a sec? Yeah. This has a thing called a shepherd loop, so it's a continuous, it, if you want to see this, go, go on your phone to fallingfalling.com and you'll hear the sound. Uh, that's that's all we can do for now. So it, we're we're a little bit handicapped today. But uh, um, if you anyone on your laptop or your phone, you could just pull up any of these websites. Uh, yeah, sound has always been very important to me. I I make music with a friend as well. But sound has always been for me a, a very. It adds a lot of emotion to the work. Uh, not, it's very interesting how that works. I'm not sure how it works, but it does work that way. If you go to maybe afterwards when you guys send out a mailing, this is my band page. Uh, the band is called Cold Void, and we make, we call it scary keyboard music. So it's electronic music with but mostly based on melodies, and each each song has its own micro video. We call it so. It's it's either a loop or a very short kind of visual idea that fits the song, and the songs and the and the music are uh, synced and related. So I encourage you to look at this. Uh, hope that answers the question. Any other questions? Uh, Stephen? Yeah, we, we don't have any more questions. No, no. I just wanted I just to say, to say I think I was five sections, but uh, everything was a little bit. Uh, 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 the, the sections were not clean. So I'm showing a little bit now of, of BYOB in Tokyo, uh, this, the Beamer event. I hope that's coming through okay. So what was interesting with BYOB is that every city felt very different. So we did the first one in Berlin, which was very chill. And then this one in, in uh, Tokyo was more funny and more fashion oriented or playful. And the one in New York was more serious. People were really uh, considering the space and inviting art critics and talking about it seriously. And New York is more professional. So I, I liked how every city had its own atmosphere and its own character. I don't know, was there ever a BYOB in your area? Um, I, don't know, I don't know if we had, I don't think we've had one in Detroit. Let me, let me, let me, let me check, 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 check to see. Yeah. yeah. Raphael, we do have a question here. Cool, hi. Uh, let me just look up Detroit. Yeah, BYOB Detroit. No, that's Seoul. Uh, well, okay, but can it, the question please? Yeah, I was wondering if you have ever considered taking uh, your visual arts uh, into virtual reality, or if that's something that you've toyed with at all. Um, this is a funny question. Uh, I'm gonna, I've been a VR skeptic very much. Like I've, I've seen the history of three-dimensional imagery on the screen and whether it's 3D TV or, first of all, I really do not like 3D movies. Whenever I'm in the theater, I'm always bummed if I have to see the 3D version because the first three minutes of the movie, you're like, wow, it's very three-dimensional. And then it's just, a, I don't like having glasses on and it kind of, makes the, the lumen, you lose a bit of luminosity through the 3D glasses. Then VR helmets, I tried them on and I always get kind of nauseous. And I don't understand how you could look at something that's this far from your eye for longer than three minutes. Um, so I, I hope someone comes up with an amazing reason why VR is great, but so far, uh, I don't see any future in it, but maybe I, I'm also not so much of a gamer. Um, 
So maybe, maybe something amazing will happen. And I know there's a lot of investment and excitement. Um, and I hope I'm proven wrong, but so far I don't like VR. I, I think I tend to just, I've always been attracted to flat surfaces. Like I've been attracted more to paintings than to sculptures. But even then, uh, when I work with a space and I can make a projection-based installation that's all around you, that's more interesting to me than a VR helmet. But maybe VR becomes interesting when it's a bit ubiquitous and then it's a, it's more of an interesting platform. I've always liked working with uh, platforms that are very broadly, um, that can spread very broadly. So now I'm doing a, a podcast with a friend. We have one episode about VR. So we talk about it in depth. If you, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send an email later with a bunch of links so uh, you guys can look at that. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I think, um, yeah, any questions, and, uh, please let me know. Yeah, we don't. There's not a lot of questions coming in from okay. here. <laughs> uh, I have another question. Um, again, going back to the work that's based on other artists. Yes. Yeah. Is that work that you're uh, continuing to do? Is it something you periodically come back to? And I was just wondering, all the work that you showed was of artists who aren't living, I believe. And then, uh, do you, are you? you ever worked with with uh, living artists work or is that a no-no um there's really no rules for me I, I try to stay away from rules even though i sometimes the brain kind of wants to make rules but i try to avoid them but um i've always been attracted to older art i'm not sure why but um there's something confusing about the, if if someone is alive I don't make collaborative work so much, no. Um, it's a good question. Let me think for a second. So there's no pattern as to when I do a cover version and, and whether I will do it again. It, it's just whenever an idea comes. Basically, my motto is if I want to do something, I do it. That's really the only, the only rule. So um, I'm always hungry for finding new ideas, so I'm always going to museums, and I like to steal or grab things from the past. I'd rather do that than grab. Maybe that's the best explanation. That I think grabbing things from the recent past would be too much uh, infringing on someone's area that they're still developing. So uh, I would feel the Chrome extension was interesting where some other people had made alternative browsers in the past of, of NetArt and then that kind of got in an area where other people had also experimented with ways of changing the browser behavior uh, and and sometimes you run into works that uh, end up being a cover version even if you didn't know so uh, uh, you didn't know somebody was already in that area and there's one more project it's not related to your question. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, there's just one more thing I wanted to show. So, oh, I misspelled it. This is the real deal, guys. Nothing is prepared. Um, no. So, I don't know if you guys know what a lenticular print is, but it's um, it's kind of like those postcards that change if you move them around. And these are big lenticular prints that I made that uh, they're basically interactive compositions without a computer. So as you move by, the colors change and um, is the video feed coming in smoothly or kind of jittery?
I hope, I hope you get, you get it. It's a little jittery, but we, you can see what's happening. Okay, because it's a very smooth uh, analog experience. So what happened was I was invited to do an exhibition and we had a sponsor for a lenticular postcard. And uh, I made a few options to test it. And most of the options were sort of like a, a, a four frame version of a smooth animation. Like I have one work with a, a jello that's moving around like this. And then I made the lenticular version and it felt very clumsy compared to what you see on the screen. So I made three images and two of them were figurative, but the third one was abstract. And then what I learned is that the, the shortcoming of the lenticular medium is that the frame rate is very low and the images between the frames are kind of blurry and that's called ghosting. But when you make an abstract work, the ghosting becomes very interesting. It doesn't become uh, a mistake. It becomes the strength of the work. And uh, so what happens now is that I make four frames. I make four images. And those are mixed by the computer and then by the lens that's in front of the print. And then you really have an infinite amount of compositions as you move your body and also according to the light in the room. Um, so. It's been interesting to sort of, I call them uh, single purpose computers that don't use electricity. They're really, it's a computation that's happening in front of your eyes uh, without any power source. So that's been an interesting, I, it, when I, this was my first uh, venture into more traditional two dimensional works. And it was an interesting bridge for me between the screen and uh, static objects. It's this weird in-between area. Uh, let me show you. No, there you go. So these are, this is again the same problem as with the tapestries where you really have to see it in real life. But uh, these are five shots of the same work in an animated GIF form. So you kind of see how many different, what's going on or what's going on in terms of uh, color variations and, and the, the color areas being in different places according to your body. So it's a pretty fixed composition in the sense that these circles are always in the same place, but the, the color inside them changes a lot. And here there's four layers where the lines are very different. So as you're moving around, you're seeing more of frame one or frame two. Or, and in this case, it's a pure color experience without any uh, it, it's, it's important to understand that the images that I feed into it are very simple and they become very complex because of the, the, the character of the technique. But it's not that I'm making a very, um, I'm not creating any of these nuances. It's always a very straightforward gradient in different directions or a circle with a gradient in different directions. And then all these complicated combina combinations arise. Um, yeah, any questions about this? Kind of speaks for itself, huh? Okay, well, I think that was, uh, those were the chapters. All right, well, Raphael, thank you so much. We, there's, again, no questions over here. Okay. I don't, I don't know if there's any more um, at Lear, but um, thank you so much for the presentation. That was great. I know everybody here really enjoyed seeing the work.
Yeah, yeah that was really interesting. Thank you for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. And send uh, send me those links and I can share it. Yeah. Okay. Bye -bye. Yeah, so if you want to send me those links, I can share with the other students. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. If you're interested, the Albert Kahn lecture starts at 7 for something totally different. <laughs>